once you have the confidence to say no, once you feel confident enough to do that, along with that comes a lot of freedom and a lot of relief as well. Business of Architecture, episode 422. Let me ask you a question. Why is it so common in the architecture industry to give away free work? My doctor doesn't give away free work and my attorney certainly doesn't give away anything for free. And yet it's so common in the architecture industry to give away work for free that many clients have come to expect it. Today I speak with Brian McCartney. Brian is a graphic designer by training and he runs a branding and communications agency specifically for architectural practices. In this episode, you'll discover the three R's for getting better recognized, increasing your practice's reputation, and turning that recognition and reputation into relationships that turn into work. We also discover and discuss the root causes of why we as architects feel pressured to give away free work, as well as some strategies to overcome this trend. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Brian, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thanks, Enoch. It's really great to be here again. Let's jump right into the three R's. I know we've probably talked about this in a past episode, but you have this great framework. And as we discussed right before we started this episode, what you guys do is you you help architects communicate their value to their ideal client. So there's a lot there that I want to unpack and ultimately help them position themselves as experts for their ideal clients. And you do this through a process that you call the three R's. What are the three R's? So the three R's uh, stand for recognition, reputation, and relationships. So in our model, essentially what we're trying to do is build recognition through online channels, primarily a SEO optimized website. Um, We're using Then we're using a process of content creation uh, where we work with our our clients to develop topics and then also to develop content. So primarily blogs, but it can also be video and other content. And that's helping to establish their reputation. And then we we use those things to build relationships. So people come to the website, they might download something, and then we're using email and other tools like social media to engage those people and try to try to strengthen those relationships. And those those people could be, you know, potential clients, but they're also it's also important to engage partners and promoters that can help us get in front of our ideal clients as well. What would you say to firm owners that especially is the case right now, they're so busy. They have so many jobs right now. They're already stretched thin trying to figure out what jobs they should say no to, which jobs they should say yes to. Is something like this even important when, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here, when we already have projects coming out of our ears? Yeah, actually, a lot of our clients um, are really super busy. uh, And... This is kind of a disease in the business world. We're we're all busy, and that when we say we're busy, we're not really talking about good busy all the time. Uh, I mean, it's great to have work, and it's great to have projects coming in, but are they the right projects? Are they the right clients? I have talked to so many architects who have told me that they've had to take on projects or they felt obligated to take on projects that they knew were bad fits. They knew were going to be disasters from the outset, but they took them on anyway. And what my role is really, or what our role here at Arcmark is, is really to help our clients, you know, become elevated. We don't want them to just get more of the same. We want them to get better and to improve and, and, and to really pursue the types of projects that they have always wanted to pursue. So yeah, 
I get it, we're all busy, but our best client really is somebody who recognizes that they're busy, but maybe not busy with the right stuff and who wants to focus on the better stuff. Now you alluded to it in that answer, but what are some of the problems that your clients who come to you, what are some of the problems that they're experiencing? Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, I think, you know, there's the, um, there's the pressure or, or uh, I think feeling of obligation. So, you know, a lot of our clients come to us and they say, well, I've gotten all my business on referrals. And when we dig deep down into that, a lot of times those referrals, you know, there's a certain obligation to do those projects or help those people in a certain way, you know, and sometimes uh, we also hear from architects who've been, you know, they've been working for 20, 30 years and they're discounting their fees to get, to convince people to work with them. Um, I don't think that's really right. I mean, that's not how it's supposed to work. And, and so we want to help them to communicate their value in a better way so that it's clear that their fees are commensurate with their experience, their expertise, their talent. Tell me, tell us dive into yep. that a little bit. How often do you see that happening? What do you mean by discounting fees? So um, they're making, I would say they're making compromises. Um, so they're either, either they're discounting their fees, like they're, they're, they're underbidding their work, I should say, let's put it that way. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily discounting their fees. I, I sometimes wonder if some architects actually know what their fees are and if it's just kind of a, you know, let's see which way the wind blows. Um, but there's, there's a tendency to give away free work as well, um, you know, to get a job, for example, or uh, as the job progresses to not, not hold the... Uh, the client to the terms of the agreement where you know if they they make changes and add things uh those fees don't get increased they they stick to the original number even though the client has changed the scope of the project so there's that scope creep that is one another example of that let's talk about giving away free work i'm just curious do you see that happening in any other industries i'm trying to think in other professional industries I don't know any doctors that are giving away free work. I can't think of any of my attorney friends who give away free work. Can you think of any other industries where it's standard practice to do work for free up front? Um, well, I can say that I think it is uh, indicative of um, creative uh, in general. I know that yeah, in my own Yeah, tell me about that field, because you're in, in a creative in, field as well. So does this sure. happen in, in branding and yeah. marketing, in graphic design? Yeah, I, I mean, so I'm part of a digital agency owners uh, mastermind group, and this is a this is a a struggle that I think all creatives have. There's a there's a certain expectation, maybe from the clients, um, maybe a misunderstanding about how we work and what we're actually what value we're actually de delivering. And so there's a tendency for clients to assume that, you know, especially like. I, I was trained as a graphic designer, right? And I came up, I, I, I think I started school in 1985. So it was the dawn of the Macintosh. And, and so I was kind of out of that first class of, uh, of uh, students that went into the real world having uh, a bit of knowledge about desktop publishing and so forth. And what I recall from that, and I still think it's still pervasive, is that a lot of people just assume, hey, it's a click of the button. All you got to do is go to the computer and click a few buttons and something magical is going to happen. That's not how creatives work. I mean, that's, the computer is just a tool. It's a hammer. It's, 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 not, a magic, uh, it's not a magic tool that uh, just uh, suddenly creates all the work for you. Uh, we still have to do the work. We still have to spend the hours of, of, of time thinking, problem solving, and, uh, you know, uh, providing value for our clients. And so I think this idea that, um, you know, it's just, it's just easy, right? You know, they, you can watch any YouTube on how to use Photoshop or whatever. And it's, you know, it's, 
it looks so simple, but there's a lot more that goes into creative work than just working on a computer. And I think, I think that kind of thinking has, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's pervasive throughout uh, creative work. You know, it's just, oh, you know, you can just, you can just hit a button and, 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 you know, get me that extra set of uh, extra set of drawings that I need or whatever. It's, it's not, it's, that's just not how it works. And we, and we have to, I think we have to take responsibility as creatives to point it out to clients that no, that's, it's not that simple. It's, it's there, there's a lot more to it than just clicking a button. Mm. One of my favorite top business books is the book by Jocko Willink, where he talks about extreme ownership. And so when talking about these things, I'm always looking at when there's problems or challenges, okay, what are we doing to enable or to contribute to this? From your perspective, what do you think we as an architecture industry are doing to enable this pervasive giving away free work that happens? I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of assumptions about this, and I hear a lot of different complaints um, from some architects. I hear that, you know, the problem is younger architects, and they're giving, you know, they're doing this, they're giving their work away for free, or they're underbidding, or whatever. I think that's kind of a dangerous way to think. And and what I try to do with my clients is not focus on what we can't control, which is other people, but focus on what we can control, which is ourselves, our mindset, and how we are presenting ourselves to the world. Um, I would say, in my experience, I've, 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 uh, my team and I have re, uh, have evaluated, let's say, evaluated. We've studied over six hundred architecture firm websites. And we've compiled a lot of data about these websites. And the one thing that we see time and time again is that a lot of architecture firm websites do not do a good job of explaining what that firm does well or the value that they provide. There's a lot of pretty pictures of you know, uh, great projects and, and so forth. But if, if we're just looking at pictures, <laughs> that doesn't really tell us much about what the architect did. And I think from my perspective as a, as a marketer, as somebody who's focused more on, you know, positioning and, and helping people to, you know, communicate that value, it really comes down to being more clear about our story and, and, and how we are delivering for our clients. I think this is one of the things that's really overlooked by architects. Um, quite frankly, I, they, there's this longstanding tradition of, well, my work will speak for itself. And I think there's, you know, there's maybe a certain amount of truth for that. If you have just really amazing standout, totally unique or, uh, you know, uh, industry uh, trend setting uh, work. But for the average architect, if you look at five different architects who design custom luxury homes, um, you know, if, if you go through their portfolios, after a certain time, they're going to start to blend in unless they're highly distinctive. So if we're trying to keep people engaged and keep them interested in what we do and what we can do for them, which is a, a key point that we need to communicate. Uh, we have to go and think beyond images and we have to start telling that story. We have to, we have to put it in words so that people can retain it and remember it uh, more carefully because if we're just looking at hundreds of images, it's going to be hard to recall. Well, who did that one uh, one house that we really loved? You know, uh, we we need to have more to it. We need to have names. We need to have, uh, you know, the process. We need to have our unique approach. We need to tell that story of how we are getting those clients from zero to that beautiful luxury custom home that we did, and and. That's that to me is, I think, a key opportunity for a lot of architects. Well, that makes perfect sense. And I'm going to put on my architect hat here. I have a lot of different hats that I wear. I have a husband hat. I have a father hat. I'm going to put on yeah. the architect hat here. And I'm going to tell you, as an architect, I'm kind of scratching my head because I'm thinking my images, that is what I do. It clearly demonstrates what it is that we do. That's why I took the pictures and put them up there. Can't you see? 
That's what we yeah, do. Yeah, I think there's, I, I think that's a, a really common tendency is to think that it's just, you know, it, 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 hey, what you see is what you get. But there's so much more to tell about how you help your clients. The, 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 the end product, the pictures are a representation of typically, you know, probably a couple, maybe three years more of work that you've done, of a relationship that you've built with this client. Uh, I, so one thing that I really try to school my clients on is the idea of not waiting till the end to tell the story. Because if you do that, you're gonna lose a lot of great information and material that you can bring to helping helping people understand the value you create. I have clients that have, you know, they've worked on projects that, you know, probably might seem, you know, maybe mundane and, and, and you know, just kind of par for the course, maybe for other architects. But we've been able to tell stories about those projects, about how that architect was able to save that client a lot of money or a lot of stress or reduce the amount of time that they needed to get to construction. I mean, there's so many ways that architects serve their clients. And it's if you wait till the end to kind of like just throw up the pictures, you're going to miss out on a lot of those key moments and opportunities where you really brought value to your clients and were able to really you know, push them forward and, and help them solve major problems. That's a key opportunity for architects. And I think that's, you know, that's really what we try to help our clients do is to just really, really figure out like, where are those opportunities to showcase how good you are at not just design, because, because I will tell you, as a designer, as a graphic designer myself, if you're just going to compete on design, there's a million designers out there. I, I mean, there's millions of them. They're everywhere. I mean, you know, there's, there's secretaries at the front at the front offices of uh, of corporations that can design uh, circles around uh, some some trained graphic designers. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that right now. Uh, we all have the same tools, uh, and I know that's different for architects. But um, if it's just about design, then uh, that's that's not going to cut it. We need to we need to show how we're solving problems, how we're delivering value for our clients too. Ah, that's beautiful. I had a friend once who told me he sent me this very interesting insight. This is a gentleman who's run been part of. He was part of Gensler for a long time. He be, became the uh, yeah. AI president for a while, and he he was sitting. We were talking at a networking meeting once. And he says we were talking about this idea about the difficulty, how, how difficult it is to clearly describe to a client the value of architecture. And he said, Enoch, here's what I've discovered. Is I've discovered that clients think that design is a noun. Architects yeah. understand that design is a verb. Yeah, It's a process. It's an iteration yes. as opposed to a unique gem that just goes poof and then there it is. Yeah, yeah and uh, that's such a good point. And, and it's so, I think it's, it's it's really relevant. I mean, you know, if 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 all that hard work and effort and problem solving and ideation and concepts, if, if it just comes down to ten pictures on your website, then then can we really question why people are undervaluing our work? You know, can we blame them for that? Not at all. We have to, architects have to take responsibility for telling their own stories, for, for showing that value. And uh, this is something that I think uh, it's only going to become more and more important as more tools come into play. You know, we're, we're, we're at, I'm even in, even in marketing, you know, we're starting to see AI become very pervasive. And What's going to happen with architecture when we have computers that are in and software that are able to do a lot of the work? Where is our value in that? So we have to stake that territory now. Um, and, 
you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of architects have kind of shot themselves in the foot by kind of ignoring this for so long. Ooh. This reminds me of a story about Schlitz beer. You're probably familiar with it. Yeah. Remember the story of Schlitz beer? I, I'm not familiar with the story of Schlitz beer. I, I mean, I may have heard it, but I, I am familiar with Schlitz beer. I grew up in the Midwest. Okay, well, let me let me tell you the story. It's a good one you could add to your arsenal. Uh, basically, they were, this was back in the earlier part of the, the 21st century, and uh, they were they were under some market pressure, had some competitors coming upon the scene. You know, their brand, which was once very strong, was becoming less recognized. And so they called in uh, Eugene Swartz, a great ad writer, copywriter, to come up with a marketing campaign for them. And mm -hmm. so what he did is he simply described the process by which the Slitch beer was made. He talked yeah. about the air filtration. He talked about the deep springs from which they got the water. He just described the process of doing it. And the campaign yeah. was a resounding success. Now, yeah. all of the other beer manufacturers were frustrated because they're like, well, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> There's nothing yes. unique about that. <laughs> exactly. But they were the first ones to tell the story and to yeah. talk about it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, I, I think that's the opportunity here. You know, we, we see this all the time is that uh, you know, architects come to us, they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not getting the projects I want. Uh, I feel like I'm undervalued. I feel like I'm under pressure with pricing and, 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 and bidding and, and so forth. Um, they want, they want to, you know, they want to, they need to tell that story because that's the only thing that's going to differentiate them. And I, you know, I, I, <laughs> this is something that I think, yeah, I talked. I, I I think I talk a lot about this quite often. Is that, you know, we we hear this word a lot, commoditization, uh, you know, and and architecture is becoming a commodity. Um, you know, I I went through this myself with the desktop publishing era. You know, design suddenly became a commodity because everybody had, you know, had a, a software that they could just put out a you know, a, a brochure or whatever, um, that, that only gets you so far, right? Because what we, what we soon realize is that, yeah, what we're, what we're really doing is just creating a lot of me mediocrity. And so if we really want to differentiate it ourselves, you know, showing how our process, how, how uh, the, the, the way we do our work the results that it gets, I, I like to refer to it as kind of the ow, the how, and the wow, right? We got the ow is like, all right, what did the client come to you? You know, what was the problem? What were they trying to figure out? What were they trying to solve? You got the, the how is like the how you did it. What was the solution you came up with? And then the wow is what was the result? What was the end of result for them, right? What do they rave about? What do they talk about? So, you know, if we just tell that story, like I, I see so many project calories, I go through them all the time. And there's so many of them. that's just like, it's just endless pictures without, you know, and maybe, maybe a minuscule little bit of text about some project details and the square footage and the data completion and the location and things like that. That, that point right there is a great place to tell that ow, how, wow uh, story. And it doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to be a novel. It just needs to be enough that helps communicate what they wanted, how you solve the problem, and then the benefit that they got out of it. It's a really simple thing to do. And then, you know, if you want to get fancy, you can start blogging and, and, and telling other stories, answering other questions for clients. And that's certainly something that we, we focus on for our clients. But just being very, uh, you know, as you're going through that project and looking for those opportunities to figure out those key points in the story and bringing that to the front when you do share that, that project, that's really important. Um, and it's something that, you know, like I said, it just, it just, it's overlooked so often. It just kind of shocks me sometimes. Yeah. <sighs> And well, we're not trained to do it. And let me circle back to this idea of That's the true. free work conversation that we were yeah. having. Okay, I'm going to backtrack here a little bit. You mentioned a couple of reasons why you see and why you think that, that we as architects give away free work and talked sure. about 
you know, competition from others, desire to please the clients. Yeah. Why, why do you think it is? Why else do you think that it is that, why do we as architects, and you can perhaps identify as a creative, why do we give away free work? I mean, I get it. We want to win the job. There's other ways to win jobs. Why do we resort to giving away stuff for free, do you think? I, you know, in my own experience and, and just in talking to a lot of architects, I think that they feel that it's expected. They think that, you know, there's this kind of like unwritten rule. Uh, I'm actually, so I'm working with a team in South Africa right now. And I, I, it's the first time that I've worked with a client in South Africa. And, and they actually, they call it risk work. <laughs> which I think is just the perfect name for it, right? It's, a ri it's risk work because you're risking doing free work without any, any guarantee or, you know, you don't know if you're going to get that project or not. Risk work, what a great name for it. I think if we called it risk work instead of free work or whatever other cute names we might have for it, I think a lot more people would be hesitant to do it. Um, so uh, I think part of the reason we do it is, yeah, I think, I think we have convinced ourselves that it's maybe a necessity to do. Not, not necessarily with anything to back that up, <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of people who just assume like they get it, they get pressured by a few clients that, you know, quite frankly, probably aren't the best clients, but they want the work or they need the work. And then there's this kind of repeated pattern that sets in like, oh, I, you know, I, yeah, I guess I could do that. Or no, I can make some compromises and concession. And it's just, it's just a not, it's not a, it's not a steep cliff. It's a gradual thing that kind of takes over and we we just get accustomed to doing it. Um, I know in the past, I've certainly been guilty of that. Uh, I've certainly have uh, offered freebies or, or uh, offered to do things that weren't part of the original plan or scope. Um, and I've, I've regretted it every time. So, you know, for me, it just, it, it became a thing where once it was once it, it, it once it became clear to me what I was doing and what I was giving up in the process, I had to I had to I had to basically tell myself I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to let that happen uh, because it's not fair to me. It's not fair to my team. Uh, it's not fair to my 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 family if I have to work extra hours to do that kind of free work or or to make up for that time, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not fair to me and I'm not going to do it anymore. And once you do that, you start to realize that there's, there's another approach. There's another way of doing things where, you know, if, if somebody's not a good fit and they're not willing to accept that you're not going to do that, those freebies and compromise for them, well, they have choices. They don't have to work with you and you don't have to work with them. And I know that that can be a daunting thing to, you know, it's, it's hard to say no sometimes because we don't know what's coming. I, you know, a lot of people are talking about a recession and there's other issues, but, but I think once you, once you have the confidence to say no, and once you have the, 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 once you feel confident enough to do that, along with that comes a lot of freedom and a lot of relief as well. And I think that's, you know, I think that's the upside of it is that once we can get to that point and realize our, our value, it's a lot easier now than to start looking for the opportunities to share that value and to communicate that. Um, so that's, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of rambling on a little bit, but um, that's that's kind of how I'm looking at it. I, I want my clients to, I don't want my clients to feel like they have to do anything or give anything away. I want them to feel like they're valued and to feel like, um, you know, in most cases, they, they are in the prime of their career. And this is the time they need to, 
they need to be excelling and uh, and and getting the recognition, getting the projects that they really want. And I want to help enable them to do that. And how how would you say that the three R's, the recognition, reputation, relationship, help architects not give away free work? Well, I think it's, that's exactly what what our what we're trying to do is to position architects so that they are seen as experts that they're, they're that they are valued um part of the way that we do that now first of all is it it always starts with looking in inward we have a process we call brand build and this is really about understanding who we are who we want to be uh, getting clear on what we call the three pillars of brand. There's actually four that we focus on, but three are um, uh, purpose, what the why we do what we do, the promise, how we want people uh, to be treated, how we want to treat our clients, the experience we're trying to create. And then uh, 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 position, is just, it's, it's how we're different, how we're unique. From there, we go to understanding our future client. So we have this process called Clear Story, which is really about workshopping who our ideal client is. So if we know who we are and if we know who our client is, we can create communications that bring those two things together, right? And we can, we can start looking at, like, what does our client really want? What do they want from us? What are their expectations? What are their hopes, ambitions, their dreams? And we can start creating content, creating a website to start, a really good website that's gonna start, you know, uh, start creating some content that is enticing and helpful and uh, informative so that our clients can go, oh, oh, well, you know, they're talking about a problem that I'm trying to solve they they you know l let's let's find out some more that then you know so that's kind of the recognition part being able to have that website that gets us found by those ideal clients then we move on to the reputation which is really about creating that content and and where we where we focus on content there's three kind of you know like i always work in threes so this is something you have to know i always work in threes so we have the no like trust, which is, you know, that's not anything earth shattering, but there's actual different types of content we can create that satisfies the no like and trust uh, kind of model. We want people to get to know us. So we have content about that, you know, and getting to know us doesn't mean like, oh, you know, what kind of beer do you drink or anything like that? It's about understanding what drives us, what motivates us, what do we care about? What, what are we trying to do for our clients? Uh, so getting them to know us a bit and then, and then we work on the, the light content, which is, uh, how we bring, you know, that's where we focus more on the, how we bring value, uh, what we do for our clients. And then we get into the trust content, which is more about the credibility and validation. And this is all, this all works within, uh, this kind of idea of the sales funnel as well, which is really kind of trying to get that, that, you know, the R, the three R's kind of model, the, the sales funnel, there's the, there's the tofu, the top of the funnel. That's the kind of recognition stuff, building that awareness. There's the reputation. That's the, the mofu, the middle of the funnel. And then we got the bofu, that's the bottom of the funnel. And that's where the reputation or the relationships come in. So, um, that trust and credibility part. So that's how it kind of works. And, our, our goal then is to really uh, work with our clients to help them create that content. And it sounds like, I think for a lot of, uh, for a lot of people who don't understand the process, that kind of sounds daunting, like, oh, we're gonna create content, what does that mean? Um, we actually do a lot of heavy lifting. So we, we will interview our clients, we'll, we'll gather up the information we need from them, and then we go off and we'll research We'll prepare SEO, uh, search engine optimized content that's going to not only answer those questions, but also bring traffic to the website. Uh, and then 
that gets followed up by, you know, things like lead magnets and downloads and all the other fun stuff that we do uh, to engage those, uh, those uh, visitors and, and hopefully convert them into interested parties. Well, that was beautifully said. So, you know, when you talk about the three R's, recognition, reputation, relationship, ultimately yeah. when you have all these playing for you, it's going to be, you're going to flip the demand basically. It's going to be easier to be able to demand fees as opposed to having to give away free work to win them. Yeah, and I think I think there's another aspect here too that's important to know. Our goal with our clients is not to be everything to everybody. Okay, I what? think if you what yeah, oh, you've just yeah, you've you just know, broken like, a hollowed a hollowed <laughs> commandment of architecture. Right, everybody just went, like, what what. <laughs> I, know, I can't I be a generalist. What are you saying, yeah, here, Brian? You're rocking my world. Yeah, we want to. We want to on generalists. Um, you know, th this is really about focus. Um, I th I think even as a you know as a creative myself, I know I know the disease. I recognize that this idea. Oh, I could do this kind of project. I could do that kind of project. Uh, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to you know? I used to. <laughs> I used to be all over the board, you know, one day I wanted to do posters the next day I wanted to do uh, album covers the next day I wanted to go work for a museum. I mean, you know, we're, we are the ADHDs of the world. Um, that's, that's our disease. But uh, what I've learned and, and what I've seen is that most architects, uh, they get to a certain point in their career and then they, they know what they want to do. You know they've they've gone through all that. They don't they don't really want to do everything, and they've they've learned a lot of lessons from trying to do that. So what we really try to help them do is focus and 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 really hone in on the types of projects that they're number one really good at, but number two that they really want to do. And so this idea of like uh, you know the three R's, it's not about having a a, a broad kind of shotgun approach. It's really about having a much more focused and uh, targeted approach that, uh, you know, I have one client, he, he's, he gets tons of people contacting him. And, and one day he said to me, he said to me, I need to turn this off. I, I, I can't answer my phone anymore. And I said, okay, okay, let's take a step back and let's look at, you know, this is before we did his website. And I said, let's look at your website. We started looking at his website, and, I, and he has this form on his website, and and you know it's basically like, you know, if you filled that out that form, uh, pretty much anybody could fill that out that form and get to him, and get on a call with him, and you know even if they had a garage or uh, you know that they wanted a, a, a permit for or or just you know like a, a porch edition or whatever, and I said okay, we're going to add some questions to this form. And we're going to qualify people out because you don't need to be answering all these calls. And then I said, and then we are going to turn your phone off. We're just going to have it go to voicemail. And so you're not going to get inundated by this. The people who are serious about wanting to work with you are going to go through this form. They're going to fill it out. And those people that answer it the right way, those are the people you're going to talk to. And the rest, we're going to say, hey, thanks for contacting us, but we are not the right firm for you. And that, that one change has brought a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, it, it's taken a lot of stress away from him. And, you know, it, it was funny because he told me, he, says, he said, it was like a week after we did this and implemented everything. He was like, I cannot tell you how thankful I am that I'm working with you because this one thing has just, it, it has changed my life. You know, he went from, you know, like probably two phones in his hands to actually being able to have some peace of mind and, and focus on the things that he really needs to focus. And I, I don't know, that's that to me is that's a big success already. And we haven't even gotten very far with him. You know, we're still working on all the other fun things that we're going to do with him. So, yeah, I love it. And the beautiful part is, is that when the business stops getting in the way of the architecture, you have more time to design. Yeah, you can do better that's, architecture. That's you can do better work. You can have happier sure. clients. Everything, for sure. Life yeah, it's better. Isn't that good? Ryan, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us today on the business of architecture. 
Hey, man, I, I really appreciate you having me. Um, uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate your friendship over the years. And uh, um, yeah, anytime you want to chat, man, let's do it. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Where can people go? Where should, where should they go to find out more about you and your, your agency? Yeah, go to arcmark.co. So arcmark.co, not .com. It's .co. Uh, A-R-C-H-M-A-R-K dot co. Uh, we have a tab on our, uh, our navigation. It's called resources. Um, we do offer web audits. So we'll audit your website, look at what's working, what's not working. We also have some great downloads, um, uh, uh, different helpful guides and information. And we have a, a pretty good blog, I think. We have some really great articles on our blog that a, a lot of people have complimented us on. And uh, they cover a gamut of things uh, related to branding and marketing for architects. Uh, that's, that's probably the best starting point. And uh, if you're really interested in talking to us, uh, there's also a button on our website that you can schedule a call with us. And uh, it's just a short introductory call to kind of get to know each other and see, see if there's a good fit for us to work together. Beautiful. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations, you can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.